I was introduced to dance um, by my Dominican mother. Um, she would dance to Juan Luis Guerra when she cooked, when she cleaned, when she talked on the phone on a Tuesday. For any reason at all, there was a reason to dance. Um, she put me in ballet when I was three. I didn't like it because it was boring, but I spent most of my time there because my parents ran a successful business and it caused them to spend a lot of time away from home. Whenever I was home, my little brother and I would make music videos together and we just had so much fun. When I got to the seventh grade, life began to change. My parents lost their businesses and had to go bankrupt, so we moved in with a family friend for about a year. Simultaneously, my father's diabetes got out of control and he got gangrene on his right foot, which caused the first of many amputations to come. The amputation started with part of the right foot, the entire right foot, then the leg right below the knee. By the time I finished my freshman year of high school, my father was a double amputee right below the hip. The memory of it causes a physical reaction in me. I could feel my arms and legs tingle and it takes me right there to back to that moment. I remember feeling People, I remember feeling afraid of what was going on, but not really, because people say that you're strong, but when you're the person needing to be strong, it's not a conscious effort. You have no other choice. So I had to take care of his wounds, and I don't know if you've ever seen amputated wounds before. It's, it's haunting. So as my friends were going out and choosing their outfits, I was tending to his wounds. And I'd say I was pretty well-versed in amputation care at that point in my life, but this time around, it was so different. And the difference was pain. My father was experiencing excruciating pain coming from his legs that were just amputated. He was experiencing pain from legs that were not there. So, when we went to the doctor, he explained to us that sometimes amputees experience what's called phantom pains. The pain is caused by the nerves of the amputated limb communicating to the mind that the leg is still there, even though it's not. Whoa, right? That was the first time I realized, like, oh my God. The mind has the capacity to cause very real pain when it's misinformed. I remember something my ballet teacher always used to say when I was in ballet class. She would say, when you brush your foot to a tendu, really pay attention to everything that's going on in your body, what it feels like. The energy going down your foot through your toes because you have to map out your body to the brain, otherwise it doesn't know it's there. So something became alarmingly clear very early in my life, and that was the mind and body connection is vital. Because if the body and the mind are not connected, the mind doesn't know what's actually going on and it could cause extreme confusion and pain. At that moment, dance became something very different for me. It became something much, much greater than attaining a reward. I was able to express emotions I couldn't understand or articulate. If I had to choose words to describe the feeling I had, when I saw my father be dismembered. The only words that come to mind based on my limitations of, of, of vocabulary was sad and upset. And that doesn't even scratch the surface of what I was feeling. So dance provided the vocabulary I didn't have. 
I was able to express my pain and my emotions and find a solution. And I didn't realize it then, but I was integrating my mental, emotional, and bodily self, and it was healing. Fast forward to the time in your life where you have to choose a career, and all of my friends were doctors and lawyers in business. That's, you know, what you're supposed to do. And I wanted to be a dancer. My abuelo was like, a what? I was like, a dancer. Of course, that didn't go that well, but I couldn't imagine doing anything else. When I got on stage, what it felt to feel the lights on your skin, the energy of the crowd, the bass of the music blasting, it takes you to another realm. It's the most alive you could feel. And I chased that feeling city after city, stage after stage, and I did it for nine years. It was amazing, but after a while I got pretty lonely. And when I looked around myself, all my friends who I graduated with were getting married and having kids, and I was not there at all. I was the only one who had chosen a path that didn't provide a predictable result. And up to then, it didn't bother me. I had never paid mind to it. But all of a sudden, when I got to the age of 30, 27, people started asking questions like, so, when are you going to get a real job? I'm like, oh, what? I got a real job. They're like, no, one with benefits. I'm like, oh, OK. When are you going to have kids? I'm like, kids? I just want to dance. Well, you know, you're about to turn 30 pretty soon, so the clock is ticking. Oh my God, they're right. I'm about to turn 30 in three years. That means in three years, my life is going to be over, OK? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? OK. Women have this invisible timeline that 30 is like a big marker for us. Like we're supposed to have it all figured out by 30. What happens in this invisible timeline, which by the way, with the, hello, Mark Chuck, mm -hmm. which by the way comes with a manual called Society's Guidelines to Being an Adult that everyone has to follow. If not, you're going to end up under a bridge, right? So women have this timeline where you're supposed to have things on your checklist leading up to having everything settled down by 30. But why are we conditioned to settle down by 30? Why aren't we conditioned to settle up, right? So I had three years, and this was literally my train of thought. I'm like, OK, I'm 27, OK. I have three years to find a job with benefits and a 401k because I will get sick and I need health insurance and I need to find someone who will marry me and have a baby before I turn 30. Otherwise, it's going to be real bad. Right? That's a whole ton of really bad decisions, right? And I felt so certain that everything I knew to be true up to that point was wrong. Dance all of a sudden became something childish and stupid. I felt like I had wasted my life up to that point. My God, my whole 20s, I should have been climbing up that ladder in corporate America. I should have just stayed with whatever boyfriend I had after high school because that meant I would have been on my way to have it figured out by 30, and here I am not having any of those things, so I was crazy. So despite the knowledge that I knew with having my body and my connection with my body, I always had this compass that guided me through life, right? Do you know that feeling you get when something feels wrong? When something is not in line with your values, what happens to your body physically? You get a physical reaction, like a feeling in your chest that tells you this is wrong. Your inner voice is saying, oh, hell no. And even your mind is like, no, 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 you should go do that decision. Your inner voice is like, oh, hell no. Mm -mm. Don't you do that, Charlene. 
even if the inner voice makes no sense, it, the feeling causes your behavior to change. That feeling is what influences your decisions. That feeling is there, that's your inner voice, to make sure that your decisions are in line with your authentic self. That's your compass, that voice. And I know this, it makes sense, right? Makes total sense. So why would anyone fall for society's mediocre sales pitch of falling in line and being like everyone else? Why? Because everyone's afraid of being alone and ending up under a bridge, which is what happened when you choose dance as a career. Just kidding. But that's why everyone's afraid of being alone. Everyone's afraid of being a failure. So you choose the safest, most predictable result. So I did it. I fell in line. You know what? I had to give up a few things that made me me, like dance, because that made me stand out from the crowd. And really anything else that I was passionate about, I gave up. But hey, I got in that line. And honestly, being normal or falling in line wasn't that bad at first. I mean, I woke up, I went to a job I hated, but hey, I got a paycheck every two weeks and I got benefits. Winning, right? I didn't really need to do much. I mean, nothing great happened, but nothing bad happened either. It was okay. It was comfortable. I really didn't need to be an active participant in my own life. It was safe and predictable. You know what? I don't even need to drive anymore. Like, I don't need to be driving my own vehicle because I could put it on autopilot and nothing will happen, right? Well, here's what starts to happen when you start falling in line. You start to shut off the voice in here and turn up the voice in here. And this voice is there to derail you from finding your purpose. It's there to derail you from tuning into who you really are, to tuning into your greatness. It becomes a disconnection of your body That state of mind is a state that a lot of us live in. I'm sure a lot of people in this room are living that way right now. But I'm still in that line. And safe and predictable is nice. And it's especially nice because I really wanted to be a mom and I was pregnant with my first. And she needed someone who was predictable. And she Mom, that was everything I wasn't safe. And so I had this vision in my head of what motherhood was going to be like. Uh, that undescribable love at first sight, matching mommy and me outfits, rainbows and glitter and all that. But it didn't happen that way for me. I attribute it to the emergency C-section and having to go under general anesthesia, so I, I wasn't there to witness her birth. So I was like, okay, for me it's gonna happen differently because of that scenario. And I waited and the weeks passed. And then that aha moment everyone talks about for me was more like a oh shit. With the added responsibilities I wasn't anticipated. I had such a hard time reconciling my vision of motherhood with the realities of what I was experiencing. And back then, social media wasn't that much of a thing, so there was not a hashtag I could look up with depressed moms. Like, it just wasn't talked about. Every single person I knew made it seem so magical, and I felt so guilty. Like, I was a broken human being because I couldn't feel all of that. So what I did is I kept it inside. I kept it to myself, and I wasn't dancing, so I couldn't express my emotions or make sense of it, so I kept it in. And I kept on going, you know? Back on the line, autopilot, pretending everything is great, but it was not great. I remember looking at myself in the mirror, and I was like, all right. And I hadn't looked at myself in a really long time. 
And I remember looking at myself and not recognizing the person I saw. It was a shell of a human. It was a shell of the person I used to be. And I felt like I was living in a parallel universe. I remember my old life vividly, but I must have like been b died and been born again into this life that totally sucked. And that's what I felt. I was that disconnected where I was almost outer bodied. And then at that moment it hit me. I was like, oh my God. Is this it? Is this it? And that is a question I hope none of you will ever ask yourself because it's an awful question to ask. Is this it? I was finished, but I wasn't finished. I had still had so much more inside of me, so much more to say, so much curiosity, so much life, but I was finished with the best of intentions. I put myself in a prison with the best of intentions and the decisions I made based on safety and practicality, not having anything to do with who I really was, I admitted myself to a slow death. I did it to myself. The happily ever after and the wellness we're seeking is terribly misdirected. I think back to my mom and my dad that they, they came from different countries to give me a good life. And I did everything right. I did everything I thought I was supposed to do. But the thing is, we have it all wrong. Society leads us up the wrong wall because it conditions us to think with our mind when the body is the one that holds all of the wisdom. I literally grabbed my daughter a trash bag put all the belongings that I could fit, and uh, I hit control all delete on that life. And I started my life over. Ironically, I was 30 years old. Since then, I've dedicated my life to helping women not lose their life. I created a dance fitness brand that sole purpose is to facilitate the mind-body connection and provide people with emotional expression and everything else that I was missing during the, that time, which was community, and I, need, I needed desperately to feel seen. So we have 350 instructors in eight different countries spreading that same mission, that the body is as important as the mind. There's no difference. It's a whole person.